Okay, so, Trinity and Christology. This is a very interesting topic. Um, it's interesting because this topic actually, well, both these topics um, are pretty much foundational to the entire Christian faith, and yet they're also some of the harder ones to understand, some of the ones that get distorted the most. Um, so obviously it's important we dive into them because this is like, if you misunderstand these, it often impacts your view of you know, the gospel. I mean, obviously it impacts the very God we worship. So that's why we've covered, obviously last week we covered scripture, foundation for where we would even have any idea of how to talk about these things. And so I will say that if you don't have the highest view of scripture, you would never come to the conclusions we're going to talk about <laughs> in this because you have to hold all of scripture together in order to have any idea what the Trinity is and who Christ is as a person. So, uh, so there's that. Um, so really when we talk about some of these doctrines tonight, it's not so much figuring out how every little thing goes together. Um, really it's a matter of holding a certain number of basic doctrines together in your mind at the same time. And there might be some mystery as to how they go together, but it's not a mystery whether they go together. If you, hold to the highest view of scripture. Um, and often th those two things get confused when people talk about the Trinity. They'll say, okay, um, yeah, I believe this is true, this is true, this is true. Um, and then they don't see how they go together. Uh, and they'll say it's a mystery whether or not they go together, whether or not it's true. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of knowing where to place the mystery. Is it whether these things go together or is it how they go together? And it's okay to not understand how they go together completely. But it is important to affirm each of the things Scripture says that we're going to be going over. Um, so it's, it's really important to see, to see uh, that distinction. Okay. So uh, we're actually going to start off with a little humor just to <laughs> lighten the mood. <laughs> so uh, anybody here ever heard of Lutheran satire on YouTube? Uh, no, but I'm familiar with Lutheran satire as a concept. As a concept. <laughs> <laughs> ever listen to Chris Rosebro? Kind of like Episcopal. <laughs> Yeah, Lutheran satire is really funny. They, I mean, they put stuff out basically on all the stuff we agree on as Christians. Um, they, they call it uh, teaching through making fun of stuff. So. Oh well, yeah. Sometimes that's the best way. So here, here goes. <laughs> Okay, Patrick, tell us a bit more about this Trinity thing. Yeah, Patrick, tell us. But remember that we're simple people without your fancy education and books and learning. And we're hearing about all of this for the first time. So try to keep it simple. Okay, Patrick? Yeah, real simple, Patrick. Sure, there are uh, three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yet there is only one God. Don't get what you're saying here, Patrick. You're not picking up what you're laying down here, Patrick. Could you use an analogy, Patrick? Sure. Uh, the Trinity is like uh, water and how you can find water in three different forms. Liquid, and ice, and vapor. That's modalism, Patrick! <laughs> modalism, an ancient heresy confessed by teachers such as Noetus and Sibelius, which espouses that God is not three distinct persons, but that he merely reveals himself in three different forms. This heresy was clearly condemned in Canon 1 at the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and those who confess it cannot rightly be considered a part of the Church Catholic. Come on, Patrick! Yeah, get it together, Patrick! Okay, uh, then the Trinity is like uh, the sun in the sky, where you have the star. I don't know what the flickering's about. And the light yes. and the heat. Oh, Patrick. Come on, Patrick. That's Arianism, Patrick. <laughs> Arianism? Yes, Arianism, Patrick. A theology which states that Christ and the Holy Spirit are creations of the Father and not one in nature with him. Exactly like how heat and light are not the star itself, but are merely creations of the star. That's a bad analogy, Patrick. You're the worst, Patrick. <laughs> All right, sorry. The Trinity is like... Uh, this three-leaf clover here. I'm gonna stop you right there, Patrick. <laughs> you hold your horses, Patrick. You're about to confess partialism. Partialism? Yes, partialism, a heresy which asserts that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not distinct persons of the Godhead, but are different parts of God, each composing one-third of the divine. 
And who confesses the heresy of partial? The first season of the cartoon program Voltron, where five robot lion cars merge together to form one giant robot samurai. Obviously. I've never heard of Voltron. Of course you haven't. It's not going to exist for another 1,500 years now, Patrick. Yeah, get with the program, Patrick. I mean, really, Patrick. I'm going to stab you in the face, Patrick. <laughs> okay, that was probably a bit much. <laughs> All right, I'll try again. Uh, the Trinity is like how the same man can be a husband and a father and an employer. Moralism again. <laughs> All right, then it's like the three layers of an animal. Partialism revisited. Fine. The Trinity is a mystery which cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is understood only through faith and is best confessed in the words of the Athanasian Creed, which states that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance, that we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord, <laughs> and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. Well, why didn't you just say that, Patrick? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's all put on some giant green foam hats, get riotously drunk, and vomit on the Chicago River to celebrate our conversion. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll just skip the rest. <laughs> okay, so... We actually are going to talk about a lot of what they just talked about. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, like I said, um, you know, there's multiple truths of the Trinity that are, we need to hold together at once. And, like, every time you try to illustrate it, you're probably going to, you know, go askew somewhere. So we're going to basically not so much talk about how all the things go together, but we're going to talk about what the foundational doctrines are. So there's going to be three foundations of the Trinity that we're going to hammer out. We're basically going to talk about what they are, and we're going to, then we're going to talk about the biblical defense of each of those foundations. Okay, so God exists as Trinity. That is the overarching category we need to understand. It's not a biblical term. You know, a lot of people who, there's some who reject the doctrine of the Trinity, and the first thing they'll say to you is, well, it's not a biblical word. And that's true, there's a, but there's a lot of truths that we summarize with words that aren't, that aren't in the Bible, um, and Trinity, Trinity is one of them. So the first foundation of it is, is it going to work? Yes. Monotheism. There is only one God. Second foundation. There are three divine persons. The third foundation is the persons are co-equal and co-eternal. Anybody need a pause? Got it? Okay. Um, and we're actually going to look at the London Baptist Confession, which I've been reading a bit lately. I really like it. It's, um, I mean, there's a few differences, obviously, in every denomination, but uh, I'd say it's the closest, like, really large uh, confession, I think, to uh, what, X, what X29 believes in, in a lot of areas. I mean, there's a few differences I could point out, but uh, I'd say... Uh, obviously, in this in this category, you know, and all Christian churches, this, these foundations are the same. I like the way the London Baptist Confession does it. There's an updated English version you can get, but I went for pretty archaic English here. <laughs> uh, okay, so would you like to read the first paragraph of the London Baptist Confession? <laughs> I've never, you know, I know all the other liturgy by heart, but yeah. okay. So, in this divine and infinite being, there are three sub substances. Subsistences. Subsistences. I'm yes. sorry. Well, that's close I'm enough. Only an editor. You're close. <laughs> I read with my mouth shut normally. Um, the Father, the Word or Son, and Holy Spirit, of one substance, power, and eternity, each having the whole divine essence, yet the essence undivided. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor perceiving. Okay. Now, Josh, would you like to do the next section? There's only... Well, you can just do the next line, really, but... <laughs> the Son is eternally begotten of the Father. Notice that, eternally begotten. Okay. And then Mr. Mr. Darn it, McCart McCartle. Yes, I'm sorry. You can do the final chunk there. The Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, all infinite, without beginning, therefore but one God, who is not to be divided in nature and being, but distinguished by several peculiar relative properties and personal relations. 
which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence on Him. And there's London Baptist Confession, chapter 2, section 3. It's a good read if you ever, you know, like that kind of, uh, like that kind of thing. And it's just a good, you know, you just read through it and you get just a lot of really good truths of the Christian faith just summarized. And then after there's a section of it, they'll have all the passages of Scripture that they got that particular summary of doctrine from. Um, but that, that's one statement. And obviously there's all kinds of Christian confessions that summarize those truths as best they can. Um, okay, so... Obviously, it's okay if you didn't get all that in one, in one bite, but we're going to start breaking it down a little bit. Okay, so these statements assume that a being and a person are not the same thing. Do you notice that? It says God is one in his being, three in his personhood. Okay. Now, we often forget, like, that sounds kind of weird. We usually don't hear it talked about that way. But we often forget that we actually talk about those categories differently all the time in our everyday language. Um, so yeah, we often forget we treat them different all the time. Um, so like a tree, for example, has being, but it's not a person. So you can you know, punch a tree, you could yell at a tree, kick a tree, and it's not going to get upset with you. But it has being. It exists. Okay? And uh, you know, a human has being. Sharon, you're a, you're a human being. And you share that being with one person. That's you. But because God is infinite, he can share his one infinite being with three persons. Okay? So we're going to start breaking down each of these truths. We just, we just basically summarized just a little more, a little more spread out. We basically are continuing to say monotheism, there's only one God, there are three divine persons. The persons are co-equal and co-eternal. Those are things that you wouldn't just come up with on your own. They seem very, those kinds of things don't usually go together. And so we have to see, if we're going to actually believe something that complicated, we have to see where it came from in Scripture. And so we're going we're gonna to dive into that. So where do we see monotheism in Scripture? That's the question. So foundational throughout Scripture is the teaching that there is only one God. Who would like to read the uh, passage here from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 8? Josh, over here, you want to read it? Josh number one, Josh number two. (laughs) Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. All right. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's actually, uh, before we look at the next one, that's actually called the Shema. Um, you know how uh, you know, Muslims go out and they pray five times a day and they have the particular set of words they say about the unity of Allah? You know, I mean, Israel had that kind of thing too. They had the kind of prayer that they would say to each other, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It comes from there in Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. It's called the Shema. We're going to talk about it just a little bit more. But... Um, Shema. You know, I put it in the book here, um, but I don't, I don't even know if I spelled it right. <laughs> I put it uh, S-H-E-M-A, but uh, it, it might be like a one syllable thing, but um, yeah. All right, so Marlena, would you like to read Isaiah 43.10? Sure. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant Right, and I will read Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. It says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it, and you are my witnesses? Is there, any, is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. And so these are just a few, a few examples. But Excellent. Okay, I must have seen it somewhere. Yeah, I, I don't remember writing that part, but I know I wouldn't be careless in like, misspelling something like that. 
<laughs> but there you go. Okay. What's the second note on monotheism in Scripture? The Shema. Is it blank after the word the or something? I think it's the Shema. Yeah. Did I did I not put that on the PowerPoint? No. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's Shema. That's right. Let me see. And all three of these are the ones that they did? Yeah, yeah, the Shema. Okay, I got you. What was that? Oh, no, I'm sorry. The first one. Just the first. The first one's the Shema. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. So next, we're going to talk about departures from monotheism. Okay, so I say each of these foundations has a set of errors that people can fall into when they depart from them. So monotheism has a, a, a couple I'll mention. I'm sure we could think of others, but... Um, First one would be polytheism. Obviously, there's more than one God. And a couple examples of those who would hold to that are, uh, so yeah, belief in multiple gods. Uh, the first example would be Mormonism, for example. Um, they'll often say that they, I mean, particularly these days, they didn't used to, but these days Mormons are often try to convince Christians that they are a Christian denomination. Uh, this is one error that they fall into, is that instead of believing in three, di three divine persons and one being, in the midst of a whole lot of other doctrinal differences, they'll say that the three persons are actually three beings. And so three gods, and then we can become gods, and God had a god before him. Basically, every being progressively becomes a god. Okay. And so there's, in Mormonism, there's actually an infinite number of gods. It's probably the most polytheist, potentially the most polytheistic religion there is. Um, and then, obviously, uh, Hinduism would be another one. Uh, Eastern you know, religions in general and Hinduism... They believe in, you know, millions of gods. Millions. So. What's the distinction between polytheism and paganism? Paganism, boy, well, I don't have a... There's no God. Well, oh. paganism, I, I think it's more of a broad category uh -huh. of, uh, you know, departure from, you know, true belief in God. Um, I'd say there might be a more, there might be a more, I, I'm sorry, what? Oh, uh, Hinduism? No, yeah. Paganism. Oh, paganism, right, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's polytheism. Then there's pantheism. Not something I've studied deeply, but in summary, it's a belief that the universe is God. That's how I've heard it described. Um, basically, everything, there's panentheism and pantheism are either the same thing or they're very similar to each other, but basically that God is everything. Everything makes up God, including us. God is a tree, God is a tree. Right. Stone, God is a... Yeah, yeah. Everything encompasses God, basically. It's sort of pantheism, yeah. And then uh, these I'm sure you've heard of, atheism. The belief that there is no God. And then agnosticism. Uh, basically the denial of whether one can know God exists, sort of the lazy way out, you know. I don't know, it's not impossible to have all the information to know, to really... Sum, to really conclude whether or not there's a God. It's agnosticism. Um, now, that's, that's, that's the uh, biblical evidence for monotheism and the departures from it. Now we're going to talk, uh, talk about the biblical evidence for three persons. Okay, this is, this is the more difficult part. Most, you know, uh, you'd say world religions are, like, at least the big ones, you know, Islam, uh, you might call Catholicism and Protestantism separate, um, but, uh, you know, Christianity is monotheistic. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so Islam, Catholicism, Protestantism, what's another world religion? Can name it. Yeah, yeah, and obviously uh, Judaism, you know, is, uh, they would all believe in one, in one God. But Christianity has this uh, particular doctrine of the Trinity that uh, ultimately, if we're going to hold to it, we need to defend scripturally. So what are we going to talk about first here? <clears throat> so scripture claims that the Father is God. Now, most Christian sects even, like... Um, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, they're going to they're gonna say the Father is God, so we're not going to dig too deeply into defending this because most people would agree on it, um, other than to just summarize and say uh, Jesus prayed to the God of the Old Testament and called him Father. And so we can see just by reading the Old Testament that the Father is God. Um, so that's about all we're going to say about that, but it gets much more controversial when you start talking about Jesus Christ being God. So we're going to defend that in a little more detail. So, yes, Scripture claims that Jesus is God. First passage up. Who wants to read John 1, 1 and 2? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Mm -hmm. He was with, in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not 
Right. Now that talks about the word being God. And then if you continue on in the passage, it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us, talking about Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, because Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, disagree with that, they'll say that, you know, Christ is a lower being. Uh, and so they actually, I mean, they'll give some defenses in the Greek, but they'll basically retranslate it. It says the, the word was a God rather than saying the word was God. Um, so basically, if you ever have one come to your door and you want to argue with them, which isn't always a bad thing, you know, if you know your scripture and you want to lead them to Christ and, and uh, have that conversation, it can, be, it can be difficult, but this isn't always the first verse you want to go to because they have their own whole uh, spiel that they've memorized on how to you know, refute this verse being about that. So there's other ways to circle around back to it, but anyways, I'll just, I'll just mention that to you. Um, next passage we'll look at, let's see here, uh, John 5.18, I'll read this one. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, when Christ was stirring up controversy, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. It's another example. Okay, this one's interesting here. I'll, I'll read this and then I'll, I'll point something out that's not necessarily clear in the text. Um, so waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is interesting. Um, it's not as clear in the King James Version because uh, they weren't aware of a lot of Greek grammar rules that we've discovered since it was translated. But uh, there's this thing called the, uh, the Granville Sharp construction. So basically when you see this here, where is it? So we have the, the final, you know, you know, main point of the sentence here, Jesus Christ. And if you see words before it, like God and Savior, uh, because of this rule, you know that both God and Savior are referring to the same thing, Jesus Christ. But in the, in the King James, it says the appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So it could mean either thing. It could mean two separate, two separate beings or referring to the same thing. But in the Greek, it's actually crystal clear. God and Savior are both referring to Jesus Christ. Just a little trivia for you there. Um, then we can look into Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Uh, I believe it's this passage that uh, many, many scholars believe is an early like hymn of, a hymn of the church that they would sing, and Paul included it in, in his letter. Um, so, uh, Sharon, you want to read that? Sure. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Isn't that great? Mm. Love that passage. So... There's just a few passages that directly talk about Jesus Christ being God, I'd say pretty explicitly. But there's some other, other ways that you can defend it as well um, that are actually almost even more interesting, I think. But um, we'll talk about them. So, so New Testament authors apply language of God in the Old Testament to Jesus. This is very interesting. So I'll, I'll read uh, Hebrews 1, 10 through 12. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the, heavens, uh, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. Somebody, anybody have a Bible? Yeah. Okay, somebody open up to Psalm 102, 25 to 27. 102? Mm -hmm. Of course, this is this is the Let's Talk Forever Bible. <laughs> so, 102 what? 102, 25 to 27. How old mm -hmm. you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. 
Now, if you go, if you talk to a Jehovah's Witness and you open up to Psalm 102 and you say, who's this talking about? They'll say, Jehovah. It's talking about God, obviously, God the Father. Uh, then open up to Hebrews 1, 10 through 12 and say, who's this talking about? If you open up and look at the context, this is what the Father says of the Son. So, see a New Testament author, the author of Hebrews, whoever it was, taking language about Yahweh in the Old Testament and applying it to Jesus Christ. It's very interesting. Then you see uh, the Apostle Paul, the next section here. Yeah, basically just said that. So yeah, you see Paul take the Old Testament sh Shema and he applies it to Jesus. Uh, now this isn't a direct quote of the Shema. I think it's a little more clear where he's getting his reference if you look at the Greek Old Testament. But um, uh, because basically that's what the uh, New Testament authors generally would quote from was the Greek Old Testament rather than the Hebrew because that was the Bible of their day. Uh, I don't have a copy of that here, but basically you'll get the point as I read this. Um, yet for us, this is 1 Corinthians 8, 6, yet for us there is one God the Father from whom are all things and for whom we exist and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So he basically took this idea there's one, there's one God here in Israel, the Lord is one, and he talks about one God and one Lord, one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. And he puts them together in, in the one being of God. It's very interesting. So, yeah, summary of that. Jesus himself, uh, yeah, next section here. Jesus himself applies Old Testament quotations from God to himself. So when he predicted uh, his betrayal by Judas, he, he said, I am telling you this now before it takes place, talking about his betrayal, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. That's John 13, 19. This is actually a direct parallel uh, to the words of God in Isaiah 43, 10 in the Greek Old Testament. So if you look in the Greek, it says, I am saying this now before it take place, takes place so that when it does take place, you will know that I am he. Obviously, God was talking about something else. But Jesus is basically using this Old Testament language that the Jewish people were familiar with and just applying it to his own person. What do I have next here? <clears throat> next, Scripture claims that the Holy Spirit is God. So we've talked about the Father being God. Didn't dig too deeply into that because most would agree with that who know their Old Testament. We talked about Jesus being God, just either explicitly being called that or the biblical authors are using language of the Father, you know, or, or language of, uh, you know, Yahweh, God, Yahweh in the Old Testament, applying it to the Son. So those uh, words of deity apply to both of them. Uh, and then obviously Jesus doing the same thing for himself. And then now we're saying Scripture claims that the Holy Spirit is God. Just point to a few little evidences of this. So he's obviously, he's mentioned in the second verse of Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So right in the first verse of Scripture there, you see the Spirit of God. This interesting way of describing, describing it. And then Paul the Apostle describes the Spirit as deity. It says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. 2 Corinthians three seventeen to 18 And then in the book of Acts, we see uh, Peter talking about the Spirit of the Lord. Um, Ananias and Sapphira, you know that story. I love that story. I mean, uh, it's so mean to say. But yeah, it's interesting. It's like, dude, you messed up. Mm. Glad we don't see that too often in this day and age in the church. But <laughs> yeah. I've, heard of, I've heard stories like that, though. It's and your husband said, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Peter says, um, so he talks about testing the Holy Spirit. Uh, and he speaks about testing, you know, God the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, and he uses it interchangeably. So I think I have the passage here. Um, it says, But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Talks very personally of the Spirit, about the Spirit being angry, the Spirit being grieved. You see just different language talked of, talked about, talking about the Spirit in that way. And these are just a, these are just a couple examples of that. 
Uh, so now we can talk about some common errors of Trinitarianism. So we've just talked about monotheism, we've talked about Trinitarianism, the defense of the three persons, and then there's, now we're going to talk about the errors you can fall into while trying to hold these truths together at the same time. Um, and these were, uh, these were some of the earliest truths sort of nailed down in confessions in the early church um, because you, know, you can see how easy it would be to, to go to one extreme or the other, you know, having multiple gods or having, uh, you know, God in different forms or something like that. It's, it's hard to hold it together. So I'm going to give you some categories here. So historically, one of the first errors was modalism. Remember the funny video we watched? They talked about that. It was historically called Sibelianism, uh, promoted by a guy named Sibelius. So it is a denial that God exists in three persons. It affirms that he exists in different manifestations at separate times. Okay, so in the Old Testament, he was the father and then came down and basically turned into the son. Depending on the denomination that teaches this, um, they'll say it in different ways. But basically, it is that God is changing forms at different times in history. That's modalism. Uh, so currently, it's promoted by the United Pentecostal Church. Uh, not to be confused with Pentecostalism in general, but there is the United Pentecostal Church. I think it's United Pentecostal Church International right now. But they teach this false doctrine of God. You know, so they're basically, you know, they would fall into the category of being a, a sect rather than a, a part of the Christian denomination. Uh, and they teach that. They teach that, right. Right, and then there is subordinationism. And what this is, is a denial of the equality of the persons. So you see, each of these is a denial of one of these, one of these foundations things that we, that we said in the beginning. It's a denial of the equality of the persons. Usually it's a denial of Christ's deity. So you see this in, uh, we talked about this, we see this with Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, they have their own form of it. You know, they have their own set of doctrines in their religion that they teach, and this is one of, one of the things they teach, that Jesus is subordinate to the Father. Um, uh, historically, uh, they mentioned it in the a video again, you know, it was promoted by Arius. Uh, Arius didn't teach all the same stuff as Jehovah's Witnesses. It was a different set of errors, but this one was similar in that he taught that Jesus was subordinate to God. He did not, like, always exist, basically. Okay, so, so you might say Jehovah's Witnesses is like a modern form of Arianism, but they are very different. Oopsies. But that's the basic error that subordinationism teaches. Uh, another one would be polytheism. We talked about this, and it's currently promoted. Uh, so yeah, it's an error that the three persons are separate beings. Okay, and we mentioned before that it is promoted by Mormons. So this is obviously more of. I mean, I, I'm not going to mention Hinduism again here, but this is more of where Christians would go awry in this area. So Mormonism is closer to Christianity, obviously, than Hinduism, but it's also radically different. Some of the very foundational things are are different. So next, <clears throat> uh, yes. Are we gonna work? Oh, there it is. Okay, I got this from uh, James White's book, uh, The Forgotten Trinity. Um, what you'll see here, is, I think this is pretty helpful. I recommend that book, by the way. I'll, I'll send you a link to it uh, during the week. But this is interesting. You see this triangle. What you have on the sides are the three foundations of the Trinity. Right. Okay. So on one side, you see you have the equality of the persons. Is that working? Yeah. And then you have three persons over here, and you have monotheism here. Okay, so let's say that you, uh, oh, this be, so let's say you get rid of three persons. Um, what do you get? Do you get the extreme of modalism? Yeah. Right? Because you have equality of the persons and you have monotheism left. They're all equal, but they're, they're equal because they're all the same being, or they're all the same person. Right? Or let's say that you get rid of monotheism but you have equality and you have three persons, then you get polytheism, right? Mormonism, for example. And then let's say you get rid of uh, the equality of the persons. Then you have subordinationism. So you have, uh, you have um, three persons and you have monotheism, but Jesus, for example, is not God. You know, he's subordinate to God, the Father. Right. So you get the idea. That's, I think that's a helpful little little chart there. So summary of the Trinity before we move on to Christology. But between them, I'm actually going to play a John Piper clip for you guys. <laughs> Give my voice rest for a minute or two. But we'll summarize really quick. There is one being of God. The 
the being of God is eternally shared by three divine persons. Notice in the, the confession it said that Christ is eternally begotten of the Father. Right? They've always existed, and so he's eternally begotten. He didn't come into existence at a point in time, like Arians would have said in the early church. Um, that's the second foundation. The Son is not the Father or the Spirit. Father is not the Son or the Spirit. And the Spirit is not the Father or the Son. They're distinct persons in one being. I, the way I heard it uh, summarized once is that the being of God is the what of God. The persons of God are the who of God. So that he's one in his being, three in his personhood. Okay, so the Trinity, this is the important part here. This is why that video was so funny. Is The Trinity is utterly unique, and it can never be perfectly illustrated. Okay. When you try to illustrate it, one, one, of, the, one of the particular foundations is probably going to fall off. You know. So it's... In order to defend the Trinity, it's, it's tempting to run, to run for an illustration, but what we need to run to is Scripture. And so we need to hold these, like I said in the beginning, we need to hold these truths together at the same time. Don't necessarily have to know how they all perfectly fit together, but we can know for sure that they do go together if we have a trust in, in the Word of God. Right. 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 But, for example, there was a conversation uh, between a guy who... I guess I, I could name names. You'd probably know who I was talking about. But uh, he, was, he was raised in a modalistic church, um, but was claiming he had become Trinitarian. Uh, and when they interviewed him publicly, uh, rather than having conviction about it, he said, I think we're all saying the same thing in different ways. Okay. While, yeah, and, it, which, and he basically talked a lot about mystery which is deceptive because mystery is important, but he was putting it in the wrong place. He wasn't saying it's mysterious how these things go together. He was saying this is mysterious whether these things go together. Oh, okay. You see the difference? Yes. Right, because he was switching to modalism, which is a heresy, rather than holding to all the truths of the Trinity and saying, I don't quite get how it all, all fits. Um, there's a big difference between those two. And so I want to encourage mystery and discourage mystery at the same time in the way that we talk about this, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I think next we have this little clip. This is actually, um, this is interesting. This is uh, from John Piper's Desiring God uh, series. He, he taught at one point. Um, he has, his, his big like, signature book is Desiring God. And his uh, catchphrase that he likes to say is, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Mm -hmm. Okay? And it's weird, but he actually points out here that uh, if you understand the way Jonathan Edwards, uh, who's his favorite uh, teacher, the way that he described uh, the Trinity... Um, you can see how the being of God and the way he exists actually goes together with the way that we function being satisfied in God and knowing God. Now, you might not quite get what I'm talking about, but he'll sort of make it clear, or at least or maybe actually fuzzy, because this is, this is a pretty abstract clip. <laughs> this might be kind of abstract so far, but this is really abstract. But uh, if you ever want to read uh, Edward's unpublished essay on the Trinity, this is a part of it. Um, so hopefully this doesn't flicker too much, but uh, we'll, see, we'll see how this goes. I'll go on back so that it... So where do I get this truth? And I've got three or four supports for it, so let's go at it. This is sub-point one under number three. Defending God is most glorified in you when you're most satisfied in from the Bible. I'm going to start with an abstruse one. Sorry, but there are a few, a few weirdos here who enjoy this kind of stuff, <laughs> who really, really like complex, deep, theological rumination, so you get four or five minutes here. Um, I, I don't think it's been that complex so far, but this is. The Trinity. The nature of the Trinity is a reason for why God has designed us such that He is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in Him. So how do I... Here is the most important paragraph I have ever read on the nature of the Trinity. And it comes from Jonathan Edwards. I just want to read it to you. This, I suppose to be that blessed Trinity that we read of in Holy Scriptures. The Father is the deity subsisting in the prime, unoriginated, and most absolute manner or the deity in its direct existence. 
The Son is the deity generated by God's understanding or having an idea of himself and subsisting in that idea. The Holy Spirit is the deity subsisting in act or the divine essence flowing out and breathes forth in God's infinite love to and delight in himself. And I believe that the whole divine essence flowing out and breathed forth in God's infinite love to and delight in himself is the Holy Spirit. I believe that the whole divine essence does truly and distinctly subsist in both in the divine idea and divine love and that each of them are properly distinct persons. Let me put that in my own words. Please. They are three persons, one divine essence. We are monotheists. It's so hard for Muslims to grasp and you got to appreciate the difficulty. One divine essence. The Father has an image of himself, and he's always had it. So when we talk about the Son being begotten or generated, we don't mean at a point in time. It's always He's always been knowing, the Father has always known himself. And this knowledge of himself is so full of all that he is that this self-known stands forth as a fully distinct person with one essence. I'm talking over my head here. I'm getting help by it. You'll see why in a minute. The, the, the energy and the love that flows back and forth between the Father and the Son, each having all the divine perfections in them, flowing back and forth, the infinite energy and love, the intensity of that divine love that flows back and forth, carries in, in him all that God is and stands forth as a third person, the Spirit. So, that means at the heart of God's being is God knowing and God enjoying. God having an idea of himself that is so full of his himself and God so fully delighting in and loving himself that that delight is himself. Now, when he created human beings in his own image. He created our souls with two main capacities. The capacity to know and the capacity to feel. And you may say, what about will? In Edward's understanding and mine, the capacity to will and feel are the same because the Affections are the lively actings of the will. They're on a continuum. So I don't have I don't have a three faculty psychology. I have a two faculty psychology. You see, this is which means that when it comes to God being glorified. That is, the whole fullness of God being reflected for who He is. What would that involve? And I'll read you the most important paragraph I ever read in helping me come to the conviction God is most glorified in me when I'm most satisfied in him. Here, here it is. This is Edwards again. Um, God glorifies himself toward the creatures in two ways. One, by appearing to their understanding. Two, by communicating himself to their hearts and in their rejoicing and delighting in and enjoying the manifestations which he makes of himself. Here's the key sentence. God is glorified not only by his glories being seen, but by its being rejoiced in. All I did was make that rhyme. 
That's exactly what I'm saying. God is most glorified in me when I'm most satisfied in him. I'll read you his sentence now. God is glorified not only by his glory being seen with the eyes of the mind and rightly known, but by its being rejoiced in. He's glorified by being rejoiced in. When those that see it delight in it, God is more glorified than if they only see it. Which means why God gets more glory from, from engaged, passionate Christians than from doctrinally correct, dead Christians. Because right doctrine glorifies one aspect of God and right affections glorify other aspects of God and he's constantly summoning us, come on, get this together, Piper, Saddleback, Bethlehem, Christians, don't become emotionalistic or intellectualistic. Get it together. Be a thinker and a feeler. Because God gave you a soul like his own being. And he means to be passionately loved and precisely known. And his truth gets glorified this way. And his value gets glorified this way. So he is most glorified when all that knowledge that we grew up with and are learning feeds a soul's satisfaction in him. All righty. That's great. That really helps. What was that? Oh, what's the link for it if you would send it? Absolutely, yeah. It's the I'll, I'll definitely put the Desiring God series in the link this week. Okay. I'll do that. I gotta go through this a few more times. You yeah. Know what? Book of Revelation. Mm hmm. The Apostle John. Yeah. Trying to describe something that we've never seen before. Right. Hmm. You totally lost me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, I took it down in shorthand, which means I did it. In two forms. Mm -hmm. That's why I didn't watch him. Mm -hmm. And it just seeps in. It's like, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. He is so delighted with him mm -hmm. that he that he loves all of himself right. to love all of us. Mm -hmm. And he loves us mm -hmm. so much when we understand him, but it rejoice in him. Right. That is just really yeah, ultimately grand. It's, yeah, it's important that we understand the Trinity in that there was relationship in the Trinity before he before the world came into existence. In other words, he wasn't lonely. No. That's not why he created. He created in order to glorify, glorify himself right. more. Right. Right. And so when he gives, if this, if I mean, this is philosophical speculation. Ultimately, that's what Edwards was doing. No, the Bible doesn't. Yeah. The Bible doesn't no. describe it that way. Yeah. But it's an interesting, you know, it's an, it is an interesting idea if it's true, in that if he if God gives you His Holy Spirit, what He's giving you is a love for Himself. It's a very so interesting. Can, and you love them back. Right. I mean, it's really very, very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were. Wow. Yeah, the way I thought about this and mm -hmm. the way I try to describe it is um, trying to use, like, from the confessions and terms of Scripture, mm -hmm. that God, Christ is the Word of God, right? Right. So when God speaks, because God is eternal and mm -hmm. awesome and infinite, Mm -hmm. That his speaking, instead of Edward G's thinking, I think. Right. His speaking is a person, but right. it's still him. It's In the beginning, God expression. created the heavens and the earth. He said, let there be light. Right. Creating the universe through Christ. Yeah, we talked about that last, last week. Right. Mm -hmm. So Christ is, in a sense, you know, God's word, the Raga. So that word is so awesome and infinite that it, he is a person also. Mm -hmm. And then the love between the two of them is such an awesome, infinite, perfect love. But that love is a person, which is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that perfect interrelationship right. you know, is just the way I've tried to understand mm -hmm. how the Trinity might. Yeah. It's you know. kind of like when you're having an absolutely wonderful day with yourself, in that 90% of the time, I don't know about you, but I can't stand myself. But I have one good day <laughs> that I really rejoice in who I am. And my abilities, and not pridefully, and it's just a whole big thankful thing, and that's what he does all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just wow. Mm -hmm. And one more thing, this understanding of the Trinity can help us with is to understand the cost of our salvation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because you think about the perfect, infinite, 
unspeakable, joyful union of the Father, Son, and Spirit and then on the cross, my God, my God, you've forsaken me. It wasn't just Christ. In a sense, it was Christ who suffered for our sins, but, but there was, was a cost cold. to God the Father and God the Spirit. And what an unimaginable loss. You can just see how God empathized with Abraham when Abraham was ready to kill his son for the stop. Mm -hmm. But yet, he went through with it. And it's just mm -hmm. freakishly unimaginable how horrific mm -hmm. uh, that was for Christ and the Father. Mm -hmm. All right. So, summarize the Trinity. Now we're moving on to a brief look at Christology, the doctrine of Jesus Christ. So, again, these were the two big foundations in the early church that had to be nailed down, was the Trinity and the person of Christ. I wouldn't be able to recount for you the order and the, which all that happened, but I have to reread it, but <laughs> reread on it. But, uh, okay. So, Christology is the study of the person of Christ. Is that working? Okay. It is the study of the incarnation, that is, the word becoming flesh. And three, it is the study of the relationship between Christ's divine and human nature. That's what we're going to talk about. Okay, so some of this we're going to be rehashing what we just talked about, but uh, talk about the foundational truths of who Christ is. We talked about the foundational truths of the Trinity, you know, monotheism, three persons, equality of the persons. Now, these are the foundational truths of who Christ is. Number one is Christ has eternally existed as a divine person. Who wants to read John 1, 1 through 3? And then I, I put verse 14 on there. But, uh... In the beginning. Okay. I'll read this one. It says, uh, when Christ was praying, he said, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And I'll close it out here with... So this is uh, when he was resurrected and he appeared to the disciples. Um, he appeared to Thomas and I said, right, he said... Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. It's interesting. Some, I actually went to, a, uh, you'll probably see some James White clips before the class is over, but uh, I went to a debate of his with a Muslim over in, uh, on Long Island and he um, talked about this passage. Some, some Muslims he had argued with, uh, he had to preempt this possible objection before the guy said it because he'd heard it before. He said, some Muslims will look at it and they say, well, he said, my Lord, like, and then he looked up and said, my God, you know, like he was praying to God while looking at Jesus, but Jesus isn't God because, you know, Muslims believe Jesus existed. They believe he was a good prophet, but, but not God. And so they respond to this by talking that way. But I guess, uh, according to him, uh, in the Greek, like this, there's like the way in which it's written, um, there's a, a case, it's called a case, like where it's, uh, it's a, in the case of address, where he, these words are undeniably addressed to, to Christ, my Lord and my God. So, uh, right. Um, next foundation is that Christ uh, was truly a human being. It, it, I would put, is truly a human being. Still has a body. Okay. So this is from Hebrews. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, had to be made, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become, oops, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation, that's uh, a, 
sacrifices, a wrath-averting sacrifice. We'll talk a lot about that in a couple sessions. Um, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So there's just, I think, the best summary I know of in Scripture that talks about why Jesus Christ had to become a human being. He had to become like us, suffer like us, in order to satisfy God's wrath for us and take on our nature. And then Colossians 2, 8 through 9. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So you see there you have deity and humanity coming together in one, in one, one passage. Okay, so here's another important uh, foundation here that often gets skewed if if uh, we're not careful, because God is unchanging, we'll talk about this when we talk about his attributes, unchanging, another word for that is immutable. Um, Because God is unchanging, the divine nature of Christ did not change when he became a man. Okay, this is called the doctrine of the hypostatic union. Don't ask me to spell it. I'm not sure. I didn't put it in the book. But (laughs) the hypostatic union, basically, when the human nature of, when God, when uh, God the Son I mean, obviously, he's eternally existed as a divine person. When that divine nature was joined to humanity, neither of those natures was skewed or mixed, okay? I think it's later on. The the name of that heresy is called Eutychianism, I believe. Um, It's where, basically, the the divine nature is skewed or the divine nature is changed. No, the the divine person of, of, the divine person, the son, did not change when he became a man. He took on a second nature, humanity, but the divine nature wasn't, wasn't changed by that. That's the hypostatic union. Kenosis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, right. It's where he emptied himself. Yeah, he emptied himself. Yeah. Um, that's orthodox teaching, kenosis, yeah. But it's, um, yeah, you just have to be careful in how you describe it and that he laid down certain privileges and he veiled certain attributes, but he didn't lose those attributes. He didn't exercise them while he was on the earth. Right, but he didn't, but he didn't, correct, right. Yeah, the divine being... The divine person did not change, right? Okay. Uh, I think I have a verse under this one. Yes. So Christ took on all that it truly means to be human other than our sinful nature. So for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. It's Hebrews 4.15. Okay. We're going to... This, this part will go quick. It's just sort of a summary, but it's uh, basically just a list of, some again, some of the errors in history that have uh, often been coupled with this. Um, I get a little more... Uh, right. Oh, yeah, I have another summary sentence here. Basically, since the incarnation, Christ has two complete natures that are distinct but inseparable. One does not mix with the other. Right. So he is, again, before the Father now, uh, interceding for us. Okay, now... So Christ's eternal nature, now this isn't so much a biblical point as a, as a logical point, um, but uh, basically with all those truths in place, we can now see you know, Christ's eternal nature was able to bear the eternal penalty for sin. So that's because of who he was, he was able to be the only one who could, who could be a sacrifice for us. And Christ's human nature was able to truly represent us and therefore save us. Okay. Now we're getting where I was trying to jump ahead to. Errors of Christology. <laughs> I remember this first one, uh, Apollinarianism. This is the only one I go into any real detail, de- detail here. The rest of it, I'll just summarize the different terms, and you can research them however you want, if you ever want to. But Apollinarianism, promoted by Apollinarius of Laodicea. Um, did I hit that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he basically said, um, it's a teaching that Jesus' mind was divine, but his body was human. Yeah, I mean, so they're trying to sort out this whole idea of the nature of Christ, and so they, they try to they start splitting him into pieces to make it make sense. It's like, okay, well, his mind must be... Okay, so uh, so Gregory of Nazianzus, Nazianzus, however you pronounce it, um, he uh, was really angry about this, and he responded, and he concluded his argument. I remember when I heard this in seminary, I was like, wow, that's, that's brilliant. How could, somebody, how could somebody see that, you know? 
But I'll read it. He says, if anyone has put their trust in him as a human being, lacking a human mind, they are themselves mindless and not worthy of salvation. <laughs> For what has not been assumed has not been healed. Assumed meaning taken on, you know. Um, and it is, what, it is what is united to his divinity that is saved. Let them not grudge us our total salvation or undo our savior with only the bones and nerves and mere appearance of humanity. Right. Right. Christ took on all of what it means to be human in order to save all of who we are. That's why that's important to have the entire, the entire human nature and the entire divine nature. So that's, that's one error. The rest, I'm just going to give you the terms. Again, we can, you can dig into them however you want. Ebionism, that's a, it denies the deity of Christ, I think, in its entirety. Um, Arianism, we talked about that. It denies the fullness of the deity of Christ. So, that, you know, they elevate him as a being, but uh, he's not quite, he's subordinate to the Father. He came into existence at a point in time, that kind of thing. Um, docetism was another one. It denies the humanity of Christ. Uh, I heard a joke about this. It's like, it's basically a teaching, you know, the poem, uh, you know, uh, well, I looked behind me, I only saw one set of footprints. It's like, because I was carrying you. Well, there's one set of footprints, but it's not because he was carrying you. It's because he had no humanity. He was basically a spirit. So that's docetism. Uh, Nestorianism denies the unity of the natures in one person. Okay, so I think Nestorianism, I think some forms of modalism teach that. They'll basically say, in Christ were two persons. And so when he was praying to God, he was praying like to himself almost like there were two persons. And okay, I, I think I think that's the error that's talking about. Again, I, I this is more of a summary. I haven't researched these in a while. Um, and then Eutychianism, we mentioned that it's basically that there was a, it, it denies the distinction of the natures. It basically says like the the nature of the person of the Son was mixed with uh, hu human nature, and there, so that there was one nature, not two natures. Okay, that's Eutychianism. Okay. So, Basically, yeah, they all kind of, it's like a soup. I don't know. How you, <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, you can find that. There's a good study Bible. ESV study Bible has a lot of those. Um, might get into a little more detail. He would direct you some, to some other sources. All right, so summary of Christology before we close up here. Um, Christ has eternally existed as a divine person. Christ took on a human nature at a point in time. Christ has two complete natures, divine and human. And I believe that's the final foundation. Yes. That is. I said it like there was more to the sentence. <laughs> Anyways, so I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, that's the Trinity in Christology. I'm thinking maybe next week we will, I'm not sure yet, I'll, I'll let you know, but I'm thinking we might combine the attributes of God with the sovereignty of God. The, what, I, what I did here was, I did it in three parts. So there's the attributes of God, but then because it's such a controversial topic, I gave a whole section to the sovereignty of God. Um, but I'm looking at this, and we might just cruise right through the, the initial attributes of God um, really quickly and have more time for the next. But then again, I might add some videos and stuff to the first one and might still do them separately, but we'll see. I'll let you know. Okay? Anybody want to close us in prayer? How about Josh over here? You want to close us in prayer? Go ahead. Josh over there and Josh over here. Yeah. <laughs> well, Lord, just thank you for this class and the uh, opportunity to learn more about you and to become closer to you and serve you in a way to glorify you, Lord. And uh, I just pray that you know, everybody gets them saved. And you know, I'm just so grateful for uh, the sacrifice that you made to support us so much. And uh, I'm just so grateful. Amen. Mm -hmm.